So welcome to the HSC Learning Community. I'm Ryan Moschel, and it's brought to you by the AHSC Education Committee. It's good to see all your faces. I'm your host. And uh, basically, this series is set up so that each of you can present your ideas, finished or not, um, innovative ideas that you can bring before the group. And then we get an opportunity at the end to discuss it, question it. Maybe it sparks interest in you for something you would like to do. Uh, but we'd love to have you, and it's a very friendly group, so please sign up for 2023. Everything's open right now for 23. Um, we have a Wave 1 graduate uh, who personally knew Thomas Hanna Lawrence Gold. Um, he's someone, and I must say this, he is the reason I'm here, and maybe quite a few of you are here, because my client found Lawrence's website, and that's the only way I knew about somatics, and I watched her get better, and that was the reason I even started this process, so I'm very grateful to Lawrence for that, for putting it out there as much as he does. Um, most of you know the rules. Be gentle, be careful, um, go slowly, don't have any pain when you do your movements, and are going to have everybody be muted in the beginning while Lawrence is presenting. If he chooses to change that, that's fine. And then we'll talk it during this discussion. So today's title, um, something that I gave to it just from um, the, the, the description that Lawrence offered, which is Higher Integration, the Myth of Aging series. And most of you know those are the movements in the back of Thomas Hanna's book, uh, Somatics. Uh, Lawrence shows and gives you the opportunity to experience enhancements to higher integration of the basic myth of that aging cat stretch. Uh, Lawrence, as I said, is Wave 1 graduate trained by Thomas Hanna. Uh, he was a trainer at the Novato Institute for two years and presented at the annual HSC conference twice, um, or convention twice. He came uh, to the training with Thomas Hanna, fortified with 20 years of practice of somatic education exercises, which he gave him the depth of somatic attention uh, to be able to advance the state of the art of state-of-the-art of clinical HANA somatic education as he continued to practice. So I will leave it at that. I'll pass it off to Lawrence, and thank you so much for being here. Okay. Hello, everybody. Am I on the air? You are. Okay, very good. So what I have in mind for today's session is to first explain what I have to present here in brief, then to show you video clips that I prepared for each of the myth of aging enhancements, and then give everybody the opportunity to test them in themselves one at a time. Uh, I'm open to receiving questions at each segment in case somehow in the unlikely event that you are unclear about something, we can clarify and go from lesson to lesson with a clean slate, free of floating questions that would otherwise distract us. Lawrence, if I could interrupt here for a moment, don't forget to raise your hand. It's in the reactions at the bottom of your screen. Just go to reactions, raise hand, and that way Lawrence can call in people individually. Uh-huh. Okay. So uh, I will be sharing my screen view of the videos that I've prepared and then be narrating what you're seeing as I do the first exposure of you to those movement uh, enhancements, it's likely that I'll be sneaking in subtle nuances of somatic education and or pandiculation as we go along. The limit will be my sensitivity to information overload. So it doesn't it means that I may not be <laughs> be able to say everything that I have to say and still stay within that constraint. So I think the first thing to do here, no, that's the second thing to do here, would be to show you now the video clips. Those video clips exist in a playlist, the address of which I've posted within the chat stream so that a person on this call can at liberty return to and view those videos. Those videos are what I call silent sessions. They are without narration and depend upon a person's seeing 
when viewing the videos without someone like me narrating to them. And I will be narrating points of interest as we go along. So let's get that started here in terms of presenting the videos. I'm going to start a screen share and and I'm waiting for the screen to populate on my end before starting the screen share. Okay, now we're in a position to do it. Bear with me while my computer goes bananas. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I'm just waiting for my computer to catch up here. Okay. So what we'll be seeing momentarily is my material for lesson one. And again, I'm waiting for the computer to catch up here. That's And Lawrence, if this goes on for much longer, I might be able to share from my end and you can tell me what to do. So let me set that up just in case. Okay, well, let's keep that as an option. Lesson one just loaded. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. There we go. So assuming the working position, we have the knee bent and out to the side. That was the a way that Tom Hanna originally taught the lesson, not legs straight next to each other. This is in part to help stabilize balance in the lifting movement. If the legs are together, the person has nothing to stop them rolling side to side. This way we stabilize the pelvis. Now, as we go into that movement, if you see that little circle thing, that's, there we are. Okay, that little movement there. The first thing, the first action there is to raise the elbow, which causes the shoulder to move back and toward the neck. What I've added there is deliberately to tighten the neck on that side. So the action is both in the neck and in the extrinsic muscles of the shoulder. That links the neck and the shoulder into a coordination pattern. Without that, the, the effect is likely to be confined just to the shoulder. This way we get the last segment of the spine, the neck involved. So that was an example of the first enhancement and how I'll be proceeding as we go along. Yeah, it may be, Ryan, that I'm going to need you to take over, but I don't even know if this is YouTube or something happening on my end. Let me try it because my video seems to be going at a good pace. So I'm going to take you off spotlight if you just remove the share screen. All right. Yeah, this is unexpected. Hold on a moment here while I get this. That's all right. Usually at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little bar that says remove spotlight. Or I should say remove share screen. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Sure. 
let's see stop share there we go at last okay let me quickly remove the spotlight bear with us everybody does everyone see that yep okay Lawrence, right. you just tell me what you want me to show and I'll go ahead and show it. You want me to play this? Yeah, let's play that and let it go past it because it was much quicker than YouTube displayed it. And I'm going to ask you to pause from time to time. Sure. So I can comment on what we're seeing. Okay, so there's the first thing. Now, watch with the second lift what happens to the straight leg by itself in case you haven't seen this before which I imagine you have. See, those two are two ends of the same thing. As soon as you lift the shoulder, okay, pause it here. There we go. Okay, now what you've seen me do as a demonstrator there is curve myself in what I like to call the banana-shaped curvature toward the working side. Now, this is a technique of aiming. The spinal muscles are rather broad from side to side. And if we do that move in the straightforward position, well, you only get the muscles closest to the spine. We can only feel that location closest to the spine. So this action of lifting and side bending enables us to involve the muscles more laterally. The leg swings the opposite direction to the curve. So if I'm curving to my right in the image, the left leg has gone left in order to counterbalance. The balance is essential because if we do a movement out of balance, we inevitably tighten up. So if we maintain good balance throughout the movement, then we have the hope of having a decent pandiculation. Okay, would you continue? So I'm showing how the leg moves the opposite direction. You see how those counterbalance in the swing? And then we come down. Okay, now toward the end of that lesson, we have an action in which we lift both legs at the same time. In this action, the way I do it is I press down with the elbow of the side of the leg that's swinging out in order to give stability. And now you see both legs are separated and we move to the position in which we can feel any soreness that may exist in the muscles behind the hip joint, particularly that's the gluteus medius. Now, what we do here is first lift one leg, find its location where we feel the medius, lift the other leg, and then equalize the two sides by feel. Equalize means they feel the same location on both sides. Then we bend toward the more sore side and do a very slow pandicular release. This is not in the standard lesson. Okay, we could pause this here, Ryan. So that you're going to have a chance to experience directly. I'm just giving you a preliminary exposure. You need not remember it. Having heard it once, it'll make it easier to hear it the second time. In the Myth of Aging series as given, the legs lift and the elbows lift, and there's no instruction to side bend. It's just a lift action involving both sides. This adds a, a movement element that can address the gluteus medius, which can be really sore in people, in case you hadn't already noticed. And this is a way of using that lesson to get something done along the same, um, at the same moment as the lesson. Okay, 
So before we go further on that, does anybody have anything to ask or tell about that? And yeah. Ryan, Ryan, if you would queue up number two. I, I have a question, Lawrence. Yes, Ava. Thank you. The importance of equalizing, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to work both sides at the same time? Are you trying to find um, where you're off because you can't really get it equal? Well, this is a good opportunity for me to sneak in an enhancement. Yes, the equalization technique requires you to sense very distinctly and to compare two things against each other. As soon as they are matched in intensity, the learning process considers them to be one unit of learning. In the process, a, pe a person may discover where they're habitually contracted. That's a secondary effect. It's a desirable secondary effect, but it's not what we're setting out to do. What we're setting out to do is to equalize the intensity and location of sensations. Now, this is for symmetrical movements. Uh, I will say here that the equalization technique can be used for movements that are all on one side, in which the intention is simply to equalize the intensity. And then during the pendicular release, we maintain the intensity in both locations, matching with each other. In other words, they both decrease together to complete rest. Does that answer your question? I think I have to um, mull and explore to sense what you're saying. Right. That's why we'll have everybody experiencing it after I do this preliminary overview. Okay. Thank you. Because words don't do it. Well, yeah. Secret. Thank you. Um, I observed that the hands were facing towards the face, so the palm of the hands were facing towards you instead of towards the ground, Lawrence. Yes. And I'm not sure if that's a significance. And the other question I have is the angle of the leg on the first part. Which leg? The, there's the straight leg and then there is the bent leg. It would have been your right leg. Okay, let's answer the second one first. It's easy. In getting into working position, I make it a point to cultivate symmetry. And the way we do that in this lesson is to plug the, the arch of the foot against the inner protuberance of the straight leg. That way, when you do the other side, you've got a reliable match. Whereas if a person just arbitrarily bends it, it can be anywhere and the muscular involvement changes according to position. Now as to the palms being up, when the palms are down, that is more aligned with the contraction of the front of the body. When the palms are up, contraction of the back of the body. It's also nicer to your forehead to have a nice soft palm instead of bony, lumpy back of the hand and fingers. You feel complete with that answer? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, anybody else? Okay, let's go to video number two. This is lesson two. Now what you're going to see is a movement of the held leg to the side. Watch what happens here. First we do the push and then the leg goes to the side. When you go far enough to the side, the opposite side arm <laughs> I'm going to have to ask you to pause it there. Good, okay. The opposite side arm, which is pushing down, experiences a movement of the shoulder blade toward the spine. Let's view some more of that video. So when the leg goes off to the side, the right shoulder goes more toward the spine and it can be felt. Now, pause there. In that position, you'll be feeling the ribs pressing the surface more on the working side, in this case, left knee side. So when a person curls forward, the ribs on the left will be in much more contact than the ribs on the right. Now, what you're going to see as I lie back again is that I stay on top of those ribs that are 
bearing the weight. That creates continuity in the movement. Here's the principle. You, go, you come out of a movement exactly along the same lines as you went into it. Not to do so is a little bit like a politician answering a question other than the one that was asked. It lacks relevancy. And so the learning is impeded by coming out of a pandiculation in a way other than one went in. And by way, I mean line of movement. So continue the playback. So now I'm on the left ribs and I sink back on the left. And then as I relax, I spread out. Okay, so that was the contralateral connection. We have an ipsilateral or a same side connection, which we do with the same approach. So here we are. Well, yeah, that's right. Okay, that's good. Now watch. So that's just the simple form. Now watch what happens when we go into the movement. The left leg is going over to the right, and the left shoulder is tucking back and under on the left side. Mm. Now we're riding on the right ribs, and we sink straight down onto those ribs to complete relaxation. You watch it one more time. All right. So that's what I have to say on that one. I think. Maybe there's more. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? Any comments or questions? Did you want to keep well, there, There's more playback. Let's wait for the complete playback and then Great. address any questions or comments. Okay, so this is the closing movement where we're bringing both knees up. And what you're seeing is that the feet are dorsiflexed, fronts of the shins tight. This movement engages the psoas muscles if the knees are kept closely enough together. Exhale, when the belly tightens, then the elbows come forward. And slowly inhale back. Okay, that completes that segment. Any questions or comments? Um, yeah, I, I have a comment. Um, that idea of going along the same line instead of deflecting just turned on a light bulb of clarification for me of how we're going into and out of the movement most effectively. So thank you. Okay, great. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, let's do the next clip. Lesson three. Now, being a sideline move, I'm going to make a comment in a moment. I'm waiting for the positioning to occur. Pause in place here. Okay. Now, you saw me make a little gesture with my hand. I was pointing to the knees being straight forward of the hip joint. So there's a 90 degree flexion at the hip joint. There it is. So I'm saying 90 degrees, see the elbow is at 90 degrees there and the hip and the knee of the top side leg are at 90 degrees. Okay, now let's stay paused here for a moment. One of the pitfalls I've seen people experience in sideline action patterns is that they're not really on their sideline edge, which means they are twisted. If they're twisted, what they're cultivating in any somatic education action pattern is a twist. And a twist is not a home rest position. Twist is an action position. So actions are always asymmetrical and rest is always symmetrical. 
that's the inherent nature of balance, symmetry. Yeah. Okay. How novel. I wonder where that's coming from. Do you hear a soundtrack, Brian? I'm looking to see if anybody's unmuted. Okay. So when you're ready, you may restart. There is a process I call finding your sideline edge. And I'm going to post a link to that video clip because it remedies the problem of people not being on their sideline edge by teaching them how to find it. All right, pause in place. Now, in this contraction moment of this pandiculation, there are a few options of enhancements to add. One is the underside leg pressing down at the shin and foot helps the top side leg and foot to lift. And anybody, would you check and see if you're muted and somehow playing back something? Okay. The other thing is that lifting the head can be done either of two or actually three ways. One is the hand lifting the head as a passive lift. So the arm and side of the body are doing all the lifting work. The other is to let the hand float on the side of the head and do the entire head lift with the side muscles of the neck and trunk. The third way is to balance the two, to equalize the two. Equalizing produces an integration up the entire length of the spine. If we do it with the head, the integration is primarily at the neck and maybe upper thoracics. And if we do it with the arm, we're using the extrinsic shoulder girdle muscles. By integrating the two, we get a change that will not occur if we do either one or the other. Another thing you may notice is the position of the underside arm with the elbow underneath the side of the ribs. Since a, this is a movement of freeing the side bending action, a pandiculation in which we come down into a longer or more exaggerated curve serves that process of awakening into integration more than if the arm were to be extended uh, past the head. Past the head is also a good position. It just doesn't give you as much curve. If you want to know the relative merits of the two, I suggest that you test both. Okay, let's continue a little bit here. Now you see how much curve there is? All right. And we're sinking straight down onto the ribs on top of the arm. What you're seeing there is a staged release. You see the little back and forth up and down? That gives you more of a change than one long pandiculation. It makes it bite size. And learning occurs more easily in bite size pieces. Okay. So now let's invite uh, questions and comments. I have one comment. Um, yes. I think two parts for this is going to really be a good idea so that we can get the most out of this. What do you think? I agree. Okay. Look so, at our, how our time is passing. Yeah. So you let you just let me know how you want to work it. Well, okay. I'll, I'll declare a good stopping point. How's that? All right. We have a little bitty question from Sigrid. Yes. My question is how important is it that the head is not propped? but that we use the size of the muscles, uh, the side muscles on the ribs to lift. Sometimes I ask my students to put a prop underneath their head, which doesn't give them quite as deep of a contraction through the sides. Sure. So it's according to the person's capacity. A person who's really contracted will not feel comfortable going into that exaggerated amount of curve on the way down. Mm -hmm. Although, 
doing the lowering movement in bite-sized pieces will, I expect, speedily resolve that problem. But yeah, prop is necessary for some people. But in the intended performance of that action pattern, no prop. That's where we're headed. So using bite size will help with that, like going into, yeah, okay. Yeah, bite size pandiculations will enable a person two things. They will feel less threatened <laughs> by their expectation that it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. And the learning will occur more quickly. Now, I'm going to bring in a point about this, which has to do with speed. One of the instructions I commonly give to people is to do the repetitions at decreasing speed and decreasing levels of effort. You, that strategy enables a person to key up or to get, increase the sensitivity of their sensory awareness. If you do it more gently, you have to pay closer attention to feel it. If you go more slowly, you give the nervous system more time to transmit sensation from the action to the sensory motor, cor the sensory motor cortex. So without changing anything, just changing speed will get results. One way I do this, by the way, is to have a person do two repetitions only of a movement. The first one at their choice of full strength, and the second one at a distinctly less level of effort. And that's because there is a, a built-in limit to how much a person can learn any action according to the contrast between their starting point and their ending point. If it's too much, they can't keep it all. It's a little like this call, too much information all at once. So they have to let it go. If you make it bite size, then they can, and if you make it slower, and if you make it gentle the second time, your starting point is at a lower level of effort, which means that if you relax by the same percentage the second time, you get a lot further into relaxation than the first time. Did that come through clearly? Anybody feel fuzzy about that? Okay. All right, let's move ourselves to the next action pattern. We also have Carol who has a question. Oh, okay. By all means, hello. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you get people to um, be really vertical in their torso when they do this, as opposed to leaning back or forward. I mean, I notice that often when people do this, they'll, even, even if they start out relatively vertical, when they come down, they'll tend to come down forward and back. So I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about how you deal with that. Sure. And that's an example of coming out of a contraction the way you went into it. Yeah. Okay. Well, there is the instructional segment I created called Locating Your Side Lying Edge, which I will post. And hmm. that's full instruction. It's from one of my programs. And so you can do it in yourself. And by that means, answer all of your little bitty questions. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And then I see we have Lisa in line here. Yeah. Hi, Lawrence. I have a, a quick question, just a clarification. I loved what you said about uh, repetition where somebody does it at their own speed and intensity first, and then you have them, you know, do less and, and be gentler. So in that kind of a instructional mode, where would you put the bite size releasing? In between. In between? Okay. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Your starting point at whatever level of effort you're using uh, has a distance of relaxation to the end point of the movement. And you can do stage-wise relaxations regardless of your starting intensity. Okay. If you're starting at a lower level of intensity, you will be developing still greater sensory awareness and control than if you hadn't done the bite-sized relaxations. Also, when you view this video on your own at a later time, you'll notice that it isn't just stopping the relaxation, but actually going a little bit past the 
state of contraction you were in before you started relaxing. In other words, you can you relax some degree, you contract again, but not as much as the first time. And then you relax and then contract again, but not as much as the last time. So it's a what we call a back stitch, so to speak. Thank okay. you. Sure. All right, Michelle, do you have something? Yeah, hi. On the sideline, uh, if you have a client that really is not comfortable having the elbow at the waist, because they, they can't handle that shoulder over shoulder feeling with the arm there. Uh, could we still have their arm up and then just use a prop underneath the waist at the curve of the waist? Yes. Okay. Again, we adapt the pendicular actions we have a person going into according to their capacity. We want them always to feel comfortable and they get to decide. Uh, it used to be sometimes I had to coach a person to uh, show me their strength because they were feeble in the pandiculation. And I want to make a point here. In Tom Hanna's article, Clinical Somatic Education, a New Discipline in the Field of Healthcare, there was a section in which he said a pandiculation must be at least of equal contraction to the sensory motor amnesia. That's the means by which the voluntary motor cortex takes over from the subcortical habituated pattern. It must be at least equal in intensity. If you want to eat healthy and feel your best. That answer it enough? Okay. Well, let's see. We're at 36 minutes. Uh, I, <laughs> I despair of the likelihood of getting experience into you in the amount of time, unless we run over. Actually, Ryan, you did say we may go further than that period of time. So let's stop at this lesson here. Could I ask you a question? Yes. So if Thomas Heine says uh, it must, uh, the pendiculation must be as equal contraction to the sensory amnesia, given that it's amnesia, how do you how do you know that you've made it? Whoops. Well, as a practitioner, how do, how do you know that you've made it equal? Well, okay. You know what I mean? Yes. Two viewpoints on that. One is the client's viewpoint. The other is the practitioner's viewpoint. As a practitioner, when a person goes into pandiculation and you've palpated that region, you know how contracted it is, and you can feel when they go into pandiculation when they've at least matched that intensity. We should be sufficiently sensitive in our awareness to be able to detect that. But the prerequisite for being able to detect it is in ourselves. We have to have experienced it in ourselves. So if we're doing that movement and you lift the elbow of, in lesson one, for example, you can feel how the muscles at the cap of the shoulder and the trapezius muscles are all engaged. And you can tell whether it's a firm contraction or kind of a half-hearted contraction. A person, by the way, should never go into cramp or spasm. If they did, they were working too hard. And so I advise my clients to cultivate a feeling of leisure, L-E-I-S-U-R-E, -E, in the movements. There should be a quality of leisure to these movements, not a, a, a quality of militaristic effort. So you should always be working within their acceptable range of comfort never causing themselves to cringe from either pain or fear of pain, always within the safety or comfort zone. Was that enough of an answer? You got more? If you're speaking, I think you're muted. Yes, you are, Eva, you're muted. I, I don't know if I really, it was, it was an answer, but I don't know if I really comprehended it because the idea of sensory amnesia is I cannot feel what I'm doing. Oh, you can feel it or you couldn't even do the contraction. No, it's not, you can't feel, it's that your sensory uh, uh, sens your sensitivity is decreased so that you're not sensing past a certain point of relaxation. 
but a pandiculation invades that zone of unconsciousness or amnesia progressively. Otherwise, you can't comprehend it. This is not something that your mind can know in advance. You have to do it, and then the words will make sense. No, I see it now. Because okay. as I go into the pandiculation, I'm heightening the experience, which I was uh, not, not sensing before. So as I heighten the experience, I start to become sensorily aware of what I'm doing in terms of my musculature, bones, whatever, mostly musculature. And then I can start to wake up the uh, dullness, which we're calling amnesia, into sensory awareness. Yes. Got it. Okay. I had to put it in my own words. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good thing to do. Put it in your own words. Huh. Okay, so we've gotten through lesson four. Now I'd like you all to have an opportunity to experience what I've been talking about. And I'll be observing if you put your camera at your work surface, and I'll be commenting accordingly. But I just want people to experience the thing at least once. So we will not be doing repetitions of a lesson. We'll be doing enough repetitions that you get the experience of what the words have described. So as I like to say in somatic education exercise sessions, ladies and gentlemen, start your nervous systems. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're going to lesson one and choose your be lying on your front. Get this image. And you choose your working side by bending the knee and turning it out to the side, planting the arch of the foot on the inner protuberance of the other, the straight leg knee joint. Okay. And you slide the bent elbow hand under your cheek next to your teeth. That's another marker for symmetry. Make sure that the back of your hand is alongside your teeth. And then lift the elbow to whatever your accustomed limit is and hold for a moment. And now lift higher so you feel the shoulder pull in toward your neck and then pull your neck in against toward your shoulder. And in that shape, do a slow lift. And the lift is properly a back bend, not so much rotation. If you do rotation, you're getting something like the obliques acting. If you do a back bend, you're dis definitively getting your paraspinal muscles involved. And then you come down naturally. And then do a repetition without bringing your neck and shoulder toward each other, if that is your custom pattern, without. And just do it that way and do a lift the same way and compare the sensation with and without equalizing the neck and shoulder actions. Now, this is to give you an experience of the difference between integrating your neck and shoulder and not. Okay, next action will be aiming. So lift the bent elbow, neck and shoulder together. Lift and notice how your straight leg wants to lift by itself and help your straight leg lift the way it wants to lift by itself, help it. And now equalize the effort of lifting the straight leg and lifting the upper torso, neck and head. And then the action should end by both the leg and the lift action of the upper torso ending at the same instant. Now, in your own experimentation, you may notice that they weren't ending at the same instant. So this is something to practice on your own 
until you can cause those actions to begin and end at the same moment. Okay, now arm lift, leg lift. And now go into the banana shaped curvature in the direction of the bent elbow side. And as you curve to the side, swing the straight leg the opposite side. Give yourself the experience of staying in balance throughout that positioning. And make it more of a back bend than a side twist. And notice that you feel it in a different location in your back than you, when you were centered and straight. Okay. So complete what you're doing. And come to complete rest. Okay. I'll give you a few seconds to breathe into that. Nothing fancy. Okay. Now, both hands turned palm up, one hand stacked on top of the other, your forehead on top of the top side hand. And now by pressing down with one elbow, help its leg to lift. And swing to the side. Here's where the elbow helps you to avoid rolling over. And find a position that locates something in that hip joint that feels uncomfortable if, there, if you have such. And you've located your working position for that side. Now the other elbow, press down and lift its leg and swing to the side to locate the same location as you found on the first side. And now lift your elbows like wings. And as you lift your head, lift also the legs. And notice if one side is more sore than the other, lean away from the more sore side until the two sides are equal. That means side bend away from the more sore side until they feel as close to equal as you can get them. And that may mean they're actually equal or maybe you couldn't get it all in one pass. And once you've found that closely equalized position, you slowly relax to complete rest. As a course of practice, it is useful to start with alternating elbows if you do more than one repetition. So you, you let the first side set the rules of positioning. The next repetition, you let the second side, the other side, set the position and let the first side match the second side's position. So this is how you clean up weird stuff in the gluteus minimus, which in my opinion does not operate in a unitary way, meaning that the whole muscle contracts no matter what you do. It depends upon your positioning, whether a posterior aspect of the gluteus medius contracts or the anterior or straight up the side. So what we're dealing with here is the posterior aspect of the gluteus medius. Okay. Next action, we go to lesson two. If you would turn on to your back. And in placing the hand behind the head and neck, don't place it behind the back of the head because that causes your head to be lifted forward somewhat. somewhat. Instead, find the mastoid bone, which is behind the ear at the base of the head on that side, and fit that bony protuberance into the notch of your palm. The notch of your palm is at the base of the palm between the eminence of the thumb and the eminence of 
the little finger. It's this notch, which is where the carpal tunnel passes through. And that fits right over the mastoid bone and the fingertips are now in good position to feel the mastoid bone of the other side without forcing your head into a lifted position. Now the other hand, we're gonna do the same side leg as the bent elbow. So bring up the knee of the bent elbow side and place the hand crosswise over the tibial tuberosity. Tibial tuberosity is the potato of the lower leg bone. It's a tuber, it stands out, it's round, and the fingers are crosswise. Gives you a much better hold than if your hand were fingers pointing along the length of your tibia. And now as you push with that leg, you hold on the arm so that the shoulder is pulled somewhat out of its socket, always within the range of comfort, and push down with the bent elbow arm and in that position, swing the engaged knee away from the bent elbow side. Far enough, you'll feel that the shoulder blade of the bent elbow side tucks under in back. And both knees should be up in this action pattern, by the way. Okay. And now as you exhale, Wait until the belly tightens before bringing the bent elbow arm forward. And when you feel that, bring the bent elbow and the knee toward each other, intending to touch if possible. Feel that the ribs you're riding on are the side opposite of the bent elbow and sink straight down onto those ribs. And then let the arm spread. Now you should be coming to complete rest between repetitions. And the second repetition is generally better at a rather lower level of effort so that you turn up your sensory sensitivity. Okay, now complete what you're doing. And now switch the hand to the opposite side knee. And don't switch the arm, just switch the hand at the leg. Now we're doing the contralateral. So if it's the right elbow bent, it's the left knee that your hand is holding. And as you breathe in, push with the, the bent, uh, the knee that you're holding, that leg, push and cause the shoulder to be drawn long and press down with the bent elbow shoulder. And now move the leg you're holding off to the side laterally, not toward the midline, but laterally. And notice when you get far enough, if you're pushing with that leg, you'll feel that the bent elbow shoulder tucks under. Then you exhale when the belly tightens, elbow forward and knee and elbow toward each other. The other foot is down. And as you inhale back, sink onto the ribs that bear the weight. And push with the knee so that the knee is at full push when the bent elbow arm is down all the way. So you're synchronizing the leg and arm movements. It's not one first and then the other second, it's both together. Okay. And complete what you're doing. Now, a word of explanation about that. Why exaggerate the contraction at the back of the body? Well, 
people are commonly co-contracted. That means opposing muscle groups are both at a heightened state of tonus. So if you start this action with a pandiculation of the back of the body, then it no longer provides resistance to curling forward. So you can get a more distinct sensation of the frontal contraction typical of the startle reflex pattern, which is what, what lesson two is about. Okay, let's proceed to the next lesson. Choose a side on which to lie and get your best approximation of being on your side lying edge. May I suggest to do that, take your top side hand and in effect, cup your armpit in the, in the palm of that hand. This is to help you find your side lying edge. If you're on your left, your right hand is cupped. So the palm is under the armpit, the thumb is in front of the pectoralis muscles and the digits, the fingertips, are behind the teres muscles of the shoulder blade. And that will help you to get into a better sideline position. This is what I'll call a quick and dirty technique. It's not as accurate as the method that I've posted. Okay. And make sure your knees are straight forward of your hips. And let's just rehearse lifting the top side leg first. So as you angle the top side lower leg up, you press the underside shin and foot down. Notice how those two actions help each other. Okay. And having gotten that lesson, top side hand draped over the top of the head, fingertips directly above the center line of the ear. And as you exhale, do the lift and notice which lifts first. Is it the arm pull or the side of the neck and trunk that lift your head? And equalize those two by alternating which one is doing more. Decrease the one that's too much. Increase the one that's too little. And when you found it, slowly relax down. And you can do that stage-wise if you like. in the back stitch. Again, ending at the same instant with both the leg action and the lifting of the head action. And the face should always be, always be straight forward so the side of the face is parallel to the floor. Okay, complete what you're doing. Okay. Then turn onto your back and sense the effect of this tiny little bit of pandiculation. Okay, let's go to lesson four. So you be on your back. Okay, and what I have for you is the culmination of that lesson, which I call the four-way twist, which some call the wash rag. And to do that, the arms... Or do it straight out, stretch to the side, your starting position. And you turn one palm down, the other palm up, and you drop the leg slowly to the palm down side, and you face the palm upside. You turn your face toward the palm upside. And when you go to the full extreme, you press down. Oh, I see something here. Don't keep your legs clamped together. Let your legs be loose so that the underside legs falls freely to the side at your determined own pace. 
but not clamped together. Okay, now in that position of the legs over, you press down with the arm that's above the head or palm up and tighten the buttock of the leg that to which side the knee is draping. So if it's your right arm that's extended and palm up, it's your left leg that's pushing down. So the buttock is tightening. And then you slowly relax that action before switching directions. Now, this is a rolling action of the arm, not a sliding action. There should be no sliding of the arm in this action pattern, strictly rolling. We would not want to be leaving rubber on the road, so to speak, from going too quickly and sliding. So the essence of this add-on or this enhancement is the linkage between the opposite side, shoulder, and buttock muscles, and you equalize those before relaxing and switching sides. Okay, and complete what you're doing. Okay. So it looks like we're going through lessons one through four today. And before we, we're gonna have some discussion before we quit, we're going to have some talk time. So Ryan, is there any way you want to um, direct us? That sounds great. Thank you, Lawrence, for presenting. One thing I wanted to suggest because uh, this is such an active presentation is that maybe some of you might want to stay on the floor and kind of roll over and ask a question and then work through that. Um, in your, There's a thought. Uh, yeah, so just, you know, we don't necessarily have to come up right into our heads if you don't want. So some of you can come up, some of you can stay <laughs> down and we'll switch over. So um, <clears throat> Thank you from uh, the Association for Hannah Somatic Education, which I know you helped to start. Thank you so much for presenting today. Um, we look forward to your second and your third and your fourth presentations in the future. Um, and let me switch over to the next recording.